history, apologetics, and current events. From the housetops, coming up next. In the 16th century, even amidst their many divergences, the so-called reformers agreed in utterly rejecting all the honors paid by the Catholic Church to the Blessed Virgin Mary, on the grounds that such veneration of the Mother detracted from the supreme worship due to her Divine Son. Four centuries have more than sufficed to show the result of so doing. The Son has followed the Mother. The descendants of those who refuse to marry the title and rights of Theotokos, Mother of God, refuse to Jesus the title of Son of God in the traditional sense of the term. Many reject his Godhead altogether, placing him merely at the head of the line of great moral and social world teachers. Others still retain the word divinity with respect to him, but for them it is no longer synonymous with deity. Holy Scripture tells us that those who first came to adore him, who is Son of God and Son of Mary, found him with Mary his mother. At the scene of the first miracle at Cana, which marked the opening of his public life, the mother of Jesus was there. In the tremendous hour when all was consummated, when types and shadows gave place to the mighty reality, there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother. And when the little flock who were to be the nucleus of the Church of God awaited in prayer the coming of the paraclete, who would teach them all truth, again it was in company with Mary the mother of Jesus. Far from taking from the honor and love due to the word incarnate, devotion to Mary is a strong bulwark protecting the central doctrine. He is ever found with his mother. Where Mary is denied her rights, sooner or later Jesus is denied his. They stand or fall together. This was realized in the year 431, when at the General Council of Ephesus, the Church condemned the Nestorian heresy, whereby the Patriarch of Constantinople, Nestorius, had taught that, since in Christ there are two persons, a divine and a human, Mary was mother only of the man Christ, and therefore could not be called mother of God. He therefore denied that wondrous and substantial union of the two natures, which we call hypostatic. On the occasion of the 15th centenary of the Council of Ephesus, the sovereign pontiff, Pius XI, issued the encyclical Lux Veritatis, recalling the history of the heresy and commenting thus upon the dogma of the hypostatic union. When once the doctrine of the hypostatic union is abandoned, whereon the dogmas of the incarnation and of man's redemption rest and stand firm, the whole foundation of the Catholic religion falls and comes to ruin. When once this dogma of the truth is securely established, it is easy to gather from it that, by the mystery of the Incarnation, the whole aggregate of men and of mundane things has been endowed with a dignity than which certainly nothing greater can be imagined, and surely grander than that to which it was raised by the work of creation. Proceeding to speak of the special dignity of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Pope emphasizes that, because she brought forth the Redeemer of mankind, she is also in a manner the most tender mother of us all, whom Christ our Lord deigned to have as his brothers. Wherefore, we may confidently entrust to her all things that are ours, our joys, our troubles, our hopes, especially if more difficult times fall upon the Church, if faith fail because charity has grown cold, if private and public morals take a turn for the worse. In this last connection, we are reminded of another result of the loss of devotion to the Mother of God. Frequently and truly, we hear and speak of the paganism of the present age. The decay of faith has been followed inevitably by a decline in morality, and our elaborate and complex civilization is threatened with a dissolving agent which contributed in no small measure to the overthrow of the magnificent civilization of old Rome, namely, the loss of the domestic virtues, the disappearance of healthy, normal family life, consequent upon the abandonment of the Christian ideals of marriage and parenthood. It is a truism that one of the greatest social effects of Christianity was to raise the status of womanhood. Her legal position in the ancient world was little better than that of a slave, and although classical literature furnishes us with examples of women who, in pagan homes, yet enjoyed high honor and affection. Such are few indeed, and but serve to prove the rule. 
divorce, infanticide, general degradation of womanhood, and not infrequently of childhood, were accepted features of pagan social order. The ideal and model of the new woman of the Christian dispensation was the mother of God. It was Mary, mother of fair love, Madonna, Our Lady, who ennobled the degenerate old civilization, just as she tamed the fierce barbarian peoples. She it was who inspired the ideals of the later chivalry. In Mary, all her sex was uplifted. In her motherhood, all motherhood became blessed. Now again, the world needs the hallowing influence of the mother of God and of men. If the life of the family, the beginning and the foundation of all human society, is to be preserved in all its nobility and its purity. Desirous to mark the commemoration and help to nourish the piety of clergy and people towards the Great Mother of God, His Holiness concludes the encyclical by establishing the new feast of the Divine Motherhood to be celebrated on October 11th by the Universal Church. Our quest for happiness. Hope is restored. God makes and keeps a promise. Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they immediately understood the gravity and utter ingratitude of their sin and stood before their Creator full of shame and sorrow. We know what the just sentence was. They were driven from the Garden of Delights into a world no longer friendly toward them. The terrible consequences of original sin became visible at once. The earth became a valley of tears. Adam and his children and his children's children could no longer know God except by the light of their reason and such graces as God still freely bestowed. As the centuries rolled on, this knowledge became more and more vague and filled with error. Creatures were substituted for God, and idolatry began. Tribes and nations lost their idea of the one God and worshipped many gods. The whole human race in Adam had lost its God-given right to eternal happiness. Gloom and despair enveloped mankind as misery and wickedness flooded the earth, for no human being could ever satisfy for the infinite injury done to God. Was mankind then destined to perish from the face of the earth? God in all justice might have abandoned our first parents to the results of their sins. He might have condemned them immediately to an eternity in hell, as he had the sinning angels. Yet God in his infinite love looked with pity and mercy upon Adam and Eve and threw them upon the whole race in its fallen state. He planned from all eternity to give man a second chance to reach his eternal destiny. Even before God pronounced sentence of justice on Adam and Eve, he made a promise to them. We have already referred to it as the veiled foretelling of the Immaculate Conception. This promise was the first glad tidings of man's redemption. Our first parents left the garden with a tiny ray of hope in their hearts, for they understood that a Redeemer had been promised. They did not, however, understand that God Himself, in the person of the Incarnate Son, was to be this Redeemer. The unfolding centuries would make it more clear. It was only in the light of the direct revelation of the Incarnation that men fully understood the first promise to mean that, as grace had been lost through the first Adam, it was to be regained through the second Adam, the Word made flesh. The seed of Eve was the Immaculate Virgin, the Mother of Christ, the Redeemer, and was destined to break the power of Satan over the human race. God not only gave the original promise to Adam to be transmitted to his descendants, but by his divine providence he guarded and guided that transmission from age to age. This he did especially by separating the Jewish nation as his chosen people. In the dark and weary period of waiting between Eden and the fullness of time when the Savior would come, the promise was often in danger of disappearing from the earth through the wickedness and forgetfulness of men. In fact, in many nations it became only a hazy legend. Therefore, God in his infinite goodness repeated it from time to time. These new promises formed the links of a chain of hope. Each link made it stronger. The promise, after being handed down by Adam, especially through the descendants of his son Seth, was continued by the descendants of Noah's son, Sem, down to the time Christ actually came on earth. The promise was renewed to Sem and to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to each of whom the promise was made that in his seed, 
the nations of the earth would be blessed. Jacob on his death prophesied of Judah his son that the scepter would not be taken away from him until he comes to whom it belongs. Genesis 49.10 Again through Moses God promised a Redeemer. And to King David he foretold an offspring of whom he said, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. God in his infinitely loving and all-wise plan willed to describe the son of David so vividly and in such detail that it would hardly be possible for men to mistake him. Therefore the Messiah was foreshadowed by persons and things in the Old Testament, and he is minutely described by the prophets. Certain characters of Old Testament times were types of the promised Redeemer because their lives and works foreshadowed his life and work. Adam, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the Judges, David, Jonas, and Solomon were types of the Savior, and they revealed him in broad outline. Certain things by which God willed to reveal the Messiah in a symbolic manner are called figures. The tree of life, the paschal lamb, the manna, the brazen serpent, and the temple, among others, foreshadowed the life and mission of the Messiah. Stay with us. We'll be back with more From the Housetops after this break. Hi, this is Elena Rodriguez with EWTN. You're listening to WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg. WQPH 89.3 FM, Shirley Fitchburg is celebrating something very special this year, our ninth anniversary. We're celebrating our ninth anniversary with special guests, prayer, and much more on a very special anniversary broadcast. Details are coming soon. We have so much more in store for you for WQPH 89.3 FM, and we can't wait to share it with you. Emergency alert. Call the governor today and say no to infanticide and the expansion of abortion in Massachusetts. This is Michael King from Massachusetts Family Institute. Both the State House of Representatives and State Senate have now passed a gross expansion of abortion, removing parental consent for 16-year-old girls in Massachusetts, allowing for infanticide, and further endangering the safety of women. This was not done to codify Roe v. Wade. This is Roe v. Wade on steroids. Petition Governor Baker to veto this abortion amendment recently passed in the current budget. Call both offices in Boston and Springfield. For more information, text the word SAVE LIFE, all one word, SAVE LIFE, to 797979. Again, text SAVE LIFE to 797979 for more information. Call the governor today. Veto the abortion amendment. On the WQPH community calendar. If you get a chance, swing down to St. Bernard's Parish at St. Camilla's Church on Mechanic Street in Fitchburg, and at the entrance, there are envelopes with the names of bishops, and we, we talked about adopt a bishop. There are prayer cards and stuff that you can grab so that you can adopt a bishop to pray for. They're sitting there right at the entrance of the church. If you walk in, you look to the right just before the confessional, they're on a little table. So if you want to do the adopt a bishop, go down to the church there, get an envelope, get the prayer cards, and adopt a bishop to pray for country needs your prayers and the bishops who are going to shepherd us through this time no matter how this time ends are going to need it more because they're going to be the ones who will help us to get to where we need to go as the princes of christ so go down there and get and grab one and adopt a bishop or just pray for a bishop on your own on the wqph community calendar Three important pro-life events are coming up soon, starting with the Jericho March, which takes place around the Massachusetts State House at 24 Beacon Street in Boston for a fair and peaceful outcome to our elections and the veto of the Roe Act every Sunday until there is a definitive outcome to our elections. That's from noon to two. And on Saturday, December 5th, from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m., Memorial for the Unborn in Boston on the steps of the State House to oppose infanticide. Side. At 1.30, placing of roses on the steps of the State House. 2 o'clock, rosary. 2.30 p.m., Speaker Kathy Hill, Massachusetts Coordinator of Silent No More. 
and a three o'clock Divine Mercy Chaplet. Then Christmas caroling at Planned Parenthood takes place on Saturday, December 19th from 10 a.m. to noon. Started in 2003, the Pro-Life Action League's Peace in the Womb Caroling Day brings the Christmas message of peace and joy to the darkness of the abortion clinic. For more information, visit prolifeaction.org slash event slash caroling 2020. Again, the Jericho March will take place every Sunday from noon to two. Memorial for the Unborn takes place on Saturday, December 5th from 1.30 to 3.30 and Christmas caroling at Planned Parenthood, December 19th from 10 a.m. to noon. Hello, this is Dana. I'm asking you to support WQPH-FM in Shirley Fitchburg so you can enjoy Catholic radio from EWTN. And here's Connie Murphy to tell you how. We certainly need your generous support. You can simply write a check payable to WQPH and mail it to WQPH 89.3 FM, Post Office Box 589, Medford, Mass, 02155. Again, that's Post Office Box 589, Medford, Mass., 02155 or you can go to our website wqphradio.org and hit the donate button. We continue now our quest for happiness. The types and figures of the Messiah sketched him in outline as it were, but God in his goodness willed to give mankind a portrait so detailed and complete that it would be man's fault if he did not recognize the Savior. This picture was sketched and gradually filled in by the prophets. The long period of Hebrew history, from the division of the kingdom of Israel under Roboam in 930 B.C. to the close of the period of restoration in 330 B.C., was a time of idolatry, misery, ruin, and captivity. During these trying times, and especially during the years when the kingdoms of Judah and Israel were in exile, God raised up prophets to keep the divine promise alive and to preserve belief in the one true God. It is these prophets especially who have given us the portrait of the expected of nations. As the appointed time drew near, the completed portrait glowed in full color. The time and the circumstances of the Messiah's birth as well as the characteristics of his life and mission, were given. In fact, all the prophecies of the Old Testament, the figures and the types, as well as every recorded event, form a complete circle of light, with its rays converging in one center, Jesus Christ the Savior. As we have said, the time of his coming was foretold. Genesis 49.10 The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs. To him shall be the obedience of nations. This prophecy spoken by Jacob reveals that when the Jews no longer ruled themselves, the time of the Redeemer would be at hand. The mother of the Savior was foretold. Isaiah 7.14 Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The Hebrew word here translated virgin actually means an unmarried maiden of marriageable age. The strict moral code of the Hebrews would require her to be a virgin. The Christian mind rightly sees in it an allusion to the virginal birth of Christ. The place of his birth is foretold, Micaeus 5.2, And thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, art a little one among the thousands of Judah, out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler of Israel, and his going forth is from the beginning, from the days of eternity. The coming of the Magi is foretold, Psalm 71. His foes shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tharsis and the isles shall offer gifts. The kings of Arabia and Saba shall bring tribute. The characteristics of the divine child are foretold in Isaiah chapter 9. For a child is born to us, and a son is given to us, and the government is upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, God the Mighty, 
the Father of the world to come, the Prince of Peace. Again, the life and passion of the Messiah is especially foretold by Isaiah. The characteristics of the Messiah as he will go about his mission of salvation are foretold in Isaiah 40. In fact, the prophet foretells the life and especially the passion of the Savior so fully that he is called the prophet evangelist. He vividly describes the ignominies and death of the Redeemer in chapters 53 and 63 as well as his conquest of the devil and the world. The one who is to be the immediate precursor of the Savior, preparing a way for him, is also foretold. Isaiah chapter 40. The voice of one crying in the desert, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The last of the prophets, Malachi, before he stepped from the stage of time, referred to St. John the Baptist as another Elias. Behold, I will send you Elias the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The portrait of the Messiah, who is to redeem man from sin and restore him to God's friendship, is completed. The one who will prepare the way of the Lord is the one who will see him and cry out, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Let us bless the Holy Trinity for the privilege of purity and innocence with which it embellished the first moment of the existence of Mary in the womb of her mother. Let us congratulate the Divine Virgin, saluting her in the very words of the Holy Spirit, Thou art all fair, O my love, and there is not a spot in thee. Canticles 4 Was it not of a truth evident that God, willing to become man in the womb of a virgin, could not employ, for the execution of so great a design, any one except a person who had been pure from the first moment of her existence? Would it have been possible that the blood which was destined to flow in the veins of a god should be soiled at its source? Could the word have allowed the devil to have the first fruits of its sanctuary and have taken for himself only the leavings of the impure spirit? Would it have been suitable that she who was to crush the head of the serpent should have been once under his empire? No, evidently. The sole idea of a mother of a god implies the idea of a creature who had always been pure and endowed from the first moment of her entrance into life with a holiness in proportion to her lofty destiny. It was necessary that the Heavenly Father, in order to associate himself in the generation of his word and make her the mother of the same God of whom he is the Father, should have a person who, far from having been for a single moment soiled, should have been, from the very origin of her existence, enriched with more purity and innocence than there is even in heaven amidst the angels. It was necessary that the word should find, in the creature who was destined from all eternity to be his mother, perfect original purity. From the moment that he incarnated himself in this daughter of Adam to make her one day his mother, he ought to have the heart of a son towards her, and of a son who desires to do his mother all the good he can, and who admits her to participate in his treasures and his riches. Therefore, it was requisite he should adorn her with purity from the first moment of her life, and be her redeemer, not by effacing a stain already contracted, but by preserving her from all stain. It was, lastly, necessary that the Holy Ghost, in order to form in Mary a man-God, and thus raise her to the dignity of his spouse, should have a person who had always been perfectly holy, and it was not too much that she should have all the virtues which a creature can have. Consequently, from all eternity, it was decreed in the counsels of God that Mary should be pure from the very first moment of her existence, that she should be enriched with all the graces and all the prerogatives of original justice, and be raised to a holiness greatly superior to that of all the saints and angels put together. It is thus that the divine maternity bestowed upon Mary the honor of the Immaculate Conception, and that the definition of it given to the world by the great pontiff Pius IX, amidst the acclamations of the whole Catholic world, is proved to be perfectly legitimate. Let us congratulate Mary on this fresh gem added to her crown, and let us love to address to her the salutation of the universal church. Thou art beautiful, and there is no stain in thee. The Immaculate Conception was the generating principle of all the virtues of Mary. Mary, so holy from the first moment of her existence, saw in this privilege 
only a reason for raising herself still higher and progressing every moment from virtue to virtue. Thus this star, so radiant at its rising, ascended ceaselessly toward its meridian, casting around itself a constantly renewed brilliancy of holiness. In ordinary souls, grace is subject to annoyance by the opposition to good and the tendency to evil, which we have with us from our birth. But in Mary Immaculate, Grace, far from meeting with any obstacle, finds all the channels of the soul open to receive it. It spreads itself in them without reserve, flows in them like a flood, and makes all the virtues expand therein. Hence that purity of conscience, of mind, of heart, of the body which made Mary appear in the eyes of heaven like a beautiful lily of dazzling whiteness. Hence that humility which renders the poverty of a cottage dear to the daughters of kings. That patience, which was invincible under suffering. That sweetness, which was never affected by opposition. That tranquility of soul in peril. That lively faith, which does not only transport mountains, but makes the eternal word descend from heaven. That hope, more heroic than that of Abraham after the death and burial of the real Isaac. That charity, O oh, charity of Mary, what a burning furnace, what a vast conflagration, what a torrent of divine flames! O holiness of Mary, how thou dost ravish my heart! Many daughters have gathered together riches. Thou hast surpassed them all. Proverbs 31 The Most High hath sanctified his own tabernacle. Psalm 55 Therefore, what most rejoices the heart of Mary is not her title of Queen of Heaven, nor that of earthly sovereign. It is much rather her immaculate conception, that which has regard to herself is nothing. The consent of God is everything to her. That is why, when she was asked what her name was by a humble virgin of lords, she replied, I am the Immaculate Conception. Let us then learn, first, always to be making progress in the path of virtue without ever saying, it is enough. And second, to place the happiness of pleasing God above all other considerations. The gift shop at St. Benedict Center in Still River is a treasure chest of devotional items. True Devotional specializes in a full line of traditional Catholic books and calendars. We also have rare and elegant religious gifts that promote a deep spiritual life, including the Center's own unique sterling silver True Devotion ring. True Devotionals, 271 Still River Road, Still River, Massachusetts. Be sure to visit our website, truedevotionals.com. From the House Stops is produced by the slaves of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Still River, Massachusetts.